Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 through 27. My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Let's pray. Father God, we're so thankful for your word, thankful that, um, that it is guiding us, thinking about our feet on the right path. And so, Father, I pray that you would guide Brandon this morning as he preaches. I pray that you would wash away the frustrations of technology that is not behaving and that you would restore to him the passion that he has for this sermon that he's leading this morning, that he would be ready and um, excited to bring us the word. And we pray that you would use your spirit to speak through Brandon, that the words that he speaks this morning would anoint us with what you have for us. We pray for your spirit to pour out over us that we would understand and be enlightened by the word of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you all for bearing with us this morning, and a uh, special thank you to the guys in the booth. You, uh, it's not their fault. It, they did everything right. It just didn't work out. So uh, This week, we're kind of wrapping up our... Um, summer series in the book of uh, Proverbs. And you may recall back in May when, when we kicked this series off, I pointed out that, that God made this book in 31 chapters, just the kind of perfect length for it to be read over the course of a month. It's as if the, the Proverbs are designed to be easily read over and over again throughout the year alongside our our continual journey through the rest of Scripture. And indeed, the passage that Sherry just read for us this morning, it reinforces the idea of returning to the wisdom of God's Word uh, over and over. Surely, you've experienced this phenomenon where you open God's Word and, and you read His truth and it, and it speaks to you. And it's, it's like brand new information, even though maybe you've even read that verse before, it just seems new. And you might say something like, this is exactly what I needed to hear today. And, and maybe that truth brings a conviction uh, to your heart. Conviction, not condemnation. And, and it helps you see how God wants you to change, to make some kind of positive change in your, in your life. And yet, by the end of the day you've already forgotten what you've read. Yeah, I was once advised to keep a food journal for a week to, to track everything that I ate throughout the day so that I could accurately kind of assess and understand uh, all the macro nutrients that I'm ingesting. You see, I, I have an artificial heart valve, so I take a particular medication and the list of foods that like, mess with it is long and, and uh, convoluted. Uh, but, but I thought to myself, I'm a pretty simple guy. I don't eat that huge of a variety of things. And I could just remember what I eat. I didn't need to write it down. But when I went back to the doctor, he asked me, like, well, what did you have for breakfast yesterday? And uh, I couldn't remember. <laughs> I think God's truth is like this a little bit. It nourishes us when we're reading it, but... By the end of the day, that, that morsel of truth, it's been uh, digested and forgotten like yesterday's breakfast. You know, I shared my food journal story with my brother, and he's like, oh, that, that wouldn't be hard for me at all. It turns out he eats the exact same thing every single day for breakfast and lunch, and then he cycles through like five different meals for dinner. And uh, I think, well, that's great, because then you really know, you really know it. And I, and I think this is why Solomon wrote down all of his wise sayings in, in 
such a concise way. It's why God caused so many of his people to write down his word instead of just having an oral tradition. It's so that we can return to it regularly until it's so familiar to us that we know it by heart. The Apostle Paul gave some interesting advice to his protege, Timothy. Uh, This is found in Timothy 3, verses 14 through 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The Proverbs, and indeed all of Scripture, are there, it's something we need to be continually learning and acquainted with. Why? So that we can be wise for salvation through faith in Jesus. Solomon teaches this lesson to his sons by admonishing them to keep his sayings in their heart and then guard them. This morning, I want to take a look at the reason that he gives for this advice and then kind of look at some, some ways that uh, the three thieves that might try to steal uh, things away from our heart. Now, the reason that Solomon gives for his teaching, it's found in verse 22, where we're told that the word of God is where we find life and healing. If something is lifeless or broken, right, either in us or in the world around us, we only have one reliable and infallible remedy for that, and that's God's word. And this is because the word of God in its original form was breathed out by God. In 2 Timothy, we see that word, breathed. And it, the, the word is uh, theonoustos. The prefix is theos, which means God. And, and the, the root of the word is pneuma. Like you might think of air uh, or pneumatic tools. Whenever we see air and God together in Scripture, we know that what we're talking about is the Holy Spirit. And this word breathed, it literally means inspired by the Spirit of God. And yeah, God employed men to write the Scriptures, people like Solomon and Paul and others. But their very words were inspired by the Holy Spirit of God within them. And therefore, that's why we can rely on them for teaching and reproof and correction and training in righteousness. And in doing so, Solomon is showing us that this will result in life and healing. And yet, when we encounter this lifelessness or this brokenness in in ourselves or in the world around us, all too often, we turn to the uh, fallible words of our idols rather than the infallible word of God. Let's look at just three idols that that I think we sometimes turn to. The first idol is our own strength and ideas. See, when we're faced with a problem, what's the first thing we do? We try to fix it ourselves. We We try harder or we chastise ourselves and demand better of ourselves. Or we, we shame ourselves in hopes of motivating ourselves to do, uh, to do better. Or we fall back on the fallacies of our childhood. You know, we've been told things like, just work harder. Work smarter, not harder. Or pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Or put your mind to it and you can do anything. And yet, if we went to Scripture instead of to our own strength, we'd encounter verses like we find in uh, John 15, where Jesus tells us that we can do nothing apart from him, but that with him, all things are possible. Another idol is that we look to the culture's strength and ideas. 
you know, whether we realize it or not, there's this culture around us that we live in, and it's trying to shape how we view the world. And, and everyone is competing with one another to get our attention and to influence our decisions. And in and of itself, that isn't really a bad thing, right? It's not wrong for a company to want to advertise their products as a possible solution to challenges that we face. It's not wrong for a politician to put forward a platform of ideas that they would Im implement if we give them our vote. It's not wrong for scientists to publish their findings and their research and suggest possible conclusions. It's not wrong for artists to make observations about what they see around them and what that might mean for us as people. I'd say it's definitely not wrong for a minister to stand up and say, hey, maybe Jesus is the way. But I think it's really easy for us to make idols out of these otherwise good things. When we allow, like, the marketing department of Apple or Google to dictate our buying decisions or to be the final word about what we need to have in order to be successful in life, I think that can challenge certain biblical concepts, maybe the biblical concept of good stewardship. If we allow news organizations or entertainment companies to determine what are the issues of our day, what are the problems we should be giving time and attention to, I think this can result in our neglect of things the Bible tells us to be paying attention to. If we allow a politician or a political idea or a movement to be the thing that we're pinning all of our hopes on, perhaps we're, that's taking our eyes off of the true Savior, Jesus. As Christians, we've been given this great gift, right? The revealed will of God in written form, the Holy Bible. And guess what? It's not out of date. It's not antiquated. It's not full of notions and ideas that are not relevant to the times that we live in. Because the God of the universe, a God who transcends the very idea of time, he breathed it into existence. And he expects his disciples to rely upon it as the rule of faith and life. And what it means is we don't look to the culture we don't follow the science. We don't even follow the church as our guide to life. Now, don't hear me wrong. Culture and science and religious tradition are all useful tools, but only in so much as they align with the revealed will and truth of God in his word. The last idol I want to talk about is other people's strength and ideas. We, we all know people that we look up to and admire, right? It's, it's easy for us to look at others and think that they kind of have things figured out. Maybe we look at a discipleship group leader and we think, man, if I just had their faith, then my life would be going so much better. Or maybe it's a parent or a grandparent or a sibling or, you know, somebody from work or a friend, just somebody where you're like, I really, really admire their success or how they're doing. You know, I'm told that most people really look up to and admire the church's assistant pastors. <laughs> if only I could be that good looking and charismatic, then life would really be going my way. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> and then, then there, are, then there are the people that we don't really know, right? But we kind of think that we know them. I'm talking about celebrities. And I think nowadays, like, we have taken celebrity worship to new heights. Or maybe it's new depths. All thanks to social media. I looked it up. I'm like, who's the most famous person on Instagram? It's Dwayne The Rock Johnson right? We, millions and millions of people get his every update. 
we, we can know what he had for breakfast, and then we can learn whatever his thoughts and musings are on everything from politics to fashion. You know what's interesting is that we as a culture have chosen a word that, that describes how we interact with people on social media. You know what that word is? We follow them. It, you know, if we follow someone, it implies that they're leading us somewhere. It implies that we have given them some level of authority in our lives to be a guide for us. You know, when someone says to me something like, I follow Miley Cyrus, I think, maybe you're not going in the right direction. Look, I greatly admire, like, the athletic ability of LeBron James, right? I'm, I am super happy that he's playing for the greatest team in the history of all American sports, right? <laughs> but I don't find his social media feed to be particularly life-giving or healing or helpful to me in my sanctification process. And, and if you really think about it, why would I, right? I don't know LeBron. I don't know how he really is. I don't know how he lives as a person. I don't know what he does with his life other than playing basketball. All I know is his carefully curated online persona. Now, God does put people in our lives to be leaders, mentors, friends, confidants, teachers, coaches, and accountability partners. We look up to people and we rely on them to some degree. And I think that is definitely biblical and it's definitely worthwhile. And the Apostle Paul endorsed this and understood it. He told the Christians in the church at Corinth, be imitators of me. But it didn't just end there, right? He also, what he fully said was, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. In other words, follow me, but only so far as I'm leading you to Jesus. Church, I hope that you will never blindly follow me or Ryan or Megan or anyone that we put up here as a leader. I hope you will follow us as, as far as we're faithfully guiding you to Jesus and the truth of his word. But if we ever miss the mark, I hope that you'll fall back on, on the teaching of the word. And I hope that you would do the same with anyone that you admire, whether that's family or friends or a politician or a celebrity. It's important for us to realize that, that we have these idols and they, and they get in our way of our reliance on God's word as the source of life and healing. As Paul wrote in 2 Timothy, the word is, is a critical element of our salvation. And it's through the application of the world that the Holy Spirit gives us spiritual life. Listen to this from Ephesians 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he did what? He made us alive together with Christ. For by grace we have been saved through faith, and this is not our own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. But it's not only life that God gives us. Solomon, he's also emphasizing the healing of, of all of our flesh. And I think Paul echoes this in his letter to the Philippians. In chapter 2, he says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, 
that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. We're told to hold fast to that word of life as we work out our own, salve, our own sanctification and, and all of that while recognizing that it is God who is doing this work within us, causing us to will and to act for his own good pleasure. And what we see in Ephesians and Philippians, what Solomon is talking about, life and healing, regeneration and sanctification, our very spiritual life from beginning to end. But how do we hold fast to that word of life? Well, we're told that we must guard our hearts. Solomon begins the poem, that, that's our passage of Scripture. He begins it with this exhortation that his son would keep his teaching in his heart. He tells him, be attentive to my words, incline your ear towards them, be sure they do not escape from your sight. See, this first part of the poem, it focuses on three body parts, the ear, the eyes, and the heart. And the the first part of guarding the heart is realizing how it's filled with wisdom through the eyes and the ears. We, We gain wisdom by fixing our eyes and ears on God's word. The springs of life flow from a full heart. And Solomon goes on to say, you know, we must vigilantly keep it guarded. That same word for springs, it's used by the prophet Ezekiel to describe the gates, the, like the exits and entrances of a city. Life flows to and fro into and out of a city through its gates. Have you ever traveled along any of the old highway routes in the U.S.? And you realize, like, there's these little ghost towns every so often. Because they used to be places where people would stop as they traveled. But when, when President Eisenhower put in all the interstate highways, those towns that were not close enough to the interstates were cut off. And they died. And our, our spiritual heart is just like this. We need to be connected to the path of God's truth. Because that's where we find life and healing Keep your heart with all vigilance. This is an interesting sentence in the Hebrews because both the noun for vigilance and the verb that we, say, that we translate as keep, they, they both have this connotation that, uh, that we're guarding something, like a prisoner, or we're guarding like, a, like something valuable that's being uh, stored inside of a, of a keep. This this kind of transitions us to this last bit of the poem which warns us of these three thieves who may try to plunder our heart's treasures. Again, the poet Solomon, he's using three body parts. This time the mouth, the eyes, and the feet. So let's look at these thieves. The first thief is the crooked mouth. See, this verse is translated as crooked speech, but it's literally mouth. And so, it kind of brings up a question. How does the mouth represent our heart's relationship with God's Word? Well, first, we know that what we say flows from the heart. If we look at Luke 6, verse 45, it says this, The good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. And second, the mouth is how we receive spiritual nourishment. This is what Jesus said in John 6. Truly, truly I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. 
So this brings us to an important question. What are we consuming? Are we consuming the words that are coming from the hearts of evil people? Or are we consuming words of life that flow from the words of God? Theologian Bruce Waltke, he points out that when Solomon says we should put away crooked speech and devious talk, he means speech that distorts, disfigures, dissembles, and deforms truth as known by the Father's teaching. Now, this brilliant bit of alliteration, it's helpful to me because it's easy to see falsehood that is obviously wrong for what it is. But when we encounter truth that has been distorted or disfigured, or when the true motives behind the words being spoken are being concealed or dissembled, it gets trickier to identify this and avoid it. It occurs to me that crooked speech really just comes from one of two sources. The first is from ourselves. Uh, There's an excellent book out there. It's called Telling Yourself the Truth. And it's written by William Bacchus. And in it, he says this. What we tell ourselves can be either one, truth, or two, lie. If you tell yourself untruths or lies, you will believe untruths and lies. If you tell yourself you're a dumb jerk who can't do anything right, you'll believe it. If you believe something, you'll act as though you believe it. And that's why your beliefs and misbeliefs are the most important factors of your mental and emotional life. But even when our talk isn't like directed at ourselves or, you know, just that like kind of casual, careless talk that we make, even that can become problematic for us. Theologian Derek Kidner uh, said this about our passage of Scripture. Superficial habits of talk react on the mind so that cynical chatter, fashionable grumbles, flippancy, and half-truths that were barely even meant in the first place. They harden into well-established habits of thought. Just a couple weeks ago, Patrick Choi was up here, and he preached about the power of the tongue to bring either life or death. Proverbs says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat of its fruits. But we're not the only source of crooked speech in our lives. Other voices also provide our heart with nourishment that is often not the bread of life. And the problem is that in, in, in um, most cases, I believe that this distorted truth is being presented to us with some of the best of intentions. Otherwise, or oftentimes, we can make the mistake of properly judging a person's motives without properly judging the truth of what they're saying. A well-meaning friend, right, could offer me a low-fat food alternative because they know I'm working on losing weight. But if I only look at their intentions, I may wind up eating foods that are actually full of carbohydrates, which are what I really need to avoid in my diet. So what do I do? If someone offers me food, I look at a food label, or I look it up online, and I find out, like, what's in this food? Is this really a healthy choice for me to be making? Based on its ingredients, not on the intentions of the person who offered it to me. And I think this is kind of the same concept that we need to employ when we are consuming speech. You know, someone with excellent intentions, someone who might be doing something really important like seeking justice or reconciliation, for example. They may put forth all kinds of ideas about how we could change the world for the better. Lately, we hear a lot about critical theory. And most of the people I know who personally ascribe to this are good people, and they have excellent intentions, and they love Jesus. 
And I'll be honest, when I first encountered it, it had a ring of truth to it. And I allowed my trust of individual people's motives to be my guide. But after a time, I began to see like, hey, some of the things that are being said, they're kind of contrary to what I am seeing when I'm reading Scripture. And as I began to investigate, like, where did these ideas come from? I began to see that some of the motives of kind of the politics and stuff involved, they're kind of being concealed. I think there's a lot of different things that are being said by people. They only want to see the world as a better place. And we hear these emphasis on things like tolerance and acceptance and love and justice and reconciliation. And as Christians, these, these stir within us the ideals that are promoted by our Savior, right? Who gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Who challenged us to seek justice for the oppressed. Who ate with sinners and who crossed over into Samaria to challenge racist ideas about who God values. And Jesus put forth love as, as both of the two greatest commandments. And I think it's easy for us when we, when we hear these terms to, to feel a connection with them on the generalities of these concepts. But I think this is why Solomon warns us in Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. You know, my mom used to say, I'm pretty sure she didn't come up with it, but I, I learned it from her. She said, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. I had a thought this week as, as I was preparing this message, and um, I was thinking, like, when we're, when we're presented with new ideas or old ideas repackaged as new ideas, uh, it's sometimes we're... Where it's, it's described as if we, we have a choice. We can either be closed-minded or we can be open-minded, right? And it's always suggested that maybe we should be open-minded to new ideas. But, but then I was thinking about uh, Romans 12 too. It says this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, I'd like to propose a, a different way of thinking about mindedness. To be closed-minded, that would be like, I would never even consider any idea that is not already in alignment with my current beliefs. Well, Romans says that we should be transformed by the renewal of our mind. So, I feel like we can't take a closed-minded approach. To be open-minded, though, would be to consider every idea as if they all had equal merit. And I, I think that being open-minded would not really be in line with, with Solomon's admonition that we guard our hearts. We don't want it to just be wide open. That sounds a lot like the double-minded man who's mentioned in the first chapter of James. Remember, he was the, the man described as being like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Romans says that we should be testing things against the revealed will of God. So I think there's a third category. It's being single-minded. And being single-minded, that person would consider new ideas, but would be single-mindedly seeking the wisdom of God as they did so. See, as Christians, we need to be vigilantly guarding our heart from the thief of the crooked mouth by carefully comparing the speech that we hear from ourselves and from others with the only infallible source of truth, which is the Word of God. The second thief that Solomon lists here is wayward eyes. Solomon admonishes us to look directly forward, to keep our gaze straight. And it, this is really just kind of building on the same concept of the crooked mouth. 
there's a theme in this poem, right, of comparing, uh, of valuing what is straight over what is crooked. And in the book of Proverbs, uh, the eyes are linked with, with our search for satisfaction in life. Proverbs 27.20 20 says, Shoal and Abaddon are never satisfied. That means death is never satisfied. And never satisfied are the eyes of man. And Proverbs 17.24 says, The discerning sets his face towards wisdom, but the eyes of a fool are on the ends of the earth. They're not looking straight at wisdom. They're looking everywhere on the horizon, looking for what's new, what's better. And again, we must ask ourselves, how do our eyes represent our heart's relationship with God's Word? Well, Jesus said this in Matthew 6, the eye is a lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. But really, I think the, the best example of the relationship between our eyes and our heart is found at that very first sin, all the way back in the Garden of Eden. You remember the serpent had tempted Eve and, and told her that her eyes would be opened, that she would be like God if she ate the fruit. And it says here, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to her eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together. See, when Eve saw that the tree was good for food and that the fruit was a delight to her eyes and then she ate it and her husband ate it. And once they had sinned, Scripture tells us that their eyes were opened and then feeling shame for the very first time, they immediately had to cover themselves. I think Job kind of understood this concept. In chapter 31 of Job, he's kind of giving a defense against those who are insinuating that his troubles are a cause of his sinful life. And, and he talks about how he has made a covenant with his eyes, that he will not look on a, on a woman who isn't his wife. And then a few verses later, he says, If my step has turned aside from the way, and my heart has gone after my eyes then let me sow and another eat. See, Job understood that our heart is going to go after whatever we have our eyes set upon. And this is why pornography is such a dangerous activity for those who would desire sexual purity. This is why alcoholics shouldn't stroll through the beer and wine aisle at Kroger. This is why people on keto shouldn't go to Krispy Kreme. How long do you think Eve spent staring at that tree, lusting after that delicious-looking fruit, before she finally talked herself into eating it? You know, we read this narrative, and we think it's kind of instantaneous, but I, I bet you it wasn't. I bet you she started off telling herself that she would never disobey God. But then she just kind of found herself kind of wandering by that tree, wandering through that part of the garden for one reason or another. And little by little, she gave more and more of her attention until it finally occupied all of her thoughts, until it became the desire of her heart. And she just knew she had to have it. And for a moment, as the juice was still running down her chin, it was amazing. And then no sooner was it gone, but the satisfaction was gone with it. And she was just left with nothing but her shame. I'm pretty sure it happened that way because that's how it happens with me. And it all begins with the wayward eye. So let me ask you, what it, where is your eye 
kind of wandering these days? What tree are you just happening to wander by from time to time? And what fruit other than the bread of life are you fixated on? There's a third thief, the swerving feet. Solomon encourages us to ponder the path that we walk to ensure that all of our ways will be sure. And he names the enemy here in the closing line of the poem, evil. It reminds me of the teaching of Jesus in John 14, where he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. See, Jesus is the way that we follow. That way leads us to truth, and when his truth is in our heart, it is life, and it is healing. But Jesus also taught us that this way isn't the easy way. In Matthew 7, he says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. The path of evil, the path to destruction, that's the easy path, and it doesn't require all of this like self-reflection and reading of Scripture and prayer and intentionality and sacrifice. The heart is to be guarded above all else, it's job one, according to Solomon, who was the wisest man who will ever live. We're to fill it with God's word and protect it from the thieves who want to plunder it. And why? Because from the heart flows the springs of life. And so my final question to you is, do we want to be governed by a heart that is filled with the righteousness of God's truth in Jesus Christ or by the evil of falsehood. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. Lord, we know we neglect your word too much. We're more concerned with things like our news feeds, our social media accounts, our entertainment, anything can distract us from that one thing that really brings us life and healing. Lord, we, we confess that to you this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would forgive me for those times that I have done that. Lord, I pray that even as I know you are faithful to forgive me, that you would bring about in my heart a conviction to prioritize your word, filling my heart with it and protecting it from anyone who would try to plunder it. I pray this for everyone in this room, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Pastor Ryan here. We're so glad that you've tuned in with us and watched one of our online sermons. Our vision as a church is to live as the family of God together proclaiming and demonstrating the gospel of grace to one another in our city. If you don't have a church home or you're looking for a church, we'd invite you to attend one of our in-person worship gatherings so you can experience all that God has for us as a community of believers on mission.